Let's play a game, this, this is gonna be fun. Here's two photos. One of these photos is taken with a $7,500 DSLR camera setup, and the other one is an iPhone 11 Pro. Can you guess which one is which? Can you see the differences? Are you pixel peeping really, really hard right now? Your answer is locked, you know which one's which. Okay, camera A is a 1DX2 with a 16 to 35 mil. This is a $7,500 setup. And camera B was my iPhone 11 Pro. And now if you were having a very hard time pixel peeping and trying to figure out which is which, and maybe, maybe you guessed wrong, and you're wondering how the heck can that be? Well, the answer is computational photography. Maybe you're wondering what the heck is that? Well, it's basically just a bunch of digital image capture and processing techniques that basically enhance your photos. And honestly, I never ever thought that smartphones, your camera phones would be good enough to ever even come close to competing with something like a 1DX Mark II. But the one mistake that I made in thinking about the future is not taking into account software, the computational photography side of things. That's just one part that my brain couldn't conceive of. Okay, so let's play the game a couple more times. Uh, here's another two photos. I will give you guys a little bit of a chance to guess. All right, camera A is the iPhone, camera B, 1DX Mark II. Did you get it right? Let's do a couple more for fun. Here's another two photos for you. Uh, take your guess. This time camera A is the iPhone and camera B is the 1DX2. Maybe you got that one wrong. Okay, here's another two photos. Man, these are like so hard. I don't feel bad at all if you're getting these wrong. Uh, it is not you, it's just that they're that close in image. Camera A is the 1DX2, camera B is the iPhone. And then let's do one final one just to maybe stump some more of you guys. Take a guess which one is which. I feel like some of you are having to pixel peep just a little bit too hard. Camera A is the iPhone, camera B is the 1DX Mark II. Well, how did you do out of five? How many did you get right? I'm, I'm genuinely curious. Please comment down below how many did you get right out of the five? Uh, because I feel like if I showed this to a lot of people, it would be like a 50-50 which people would guess. And I asked on Twitter the same question uh, with that first example, and most people were able to guess that that camera B was the iPhone, but there were still a lot of people that were getting fooled just one after another. And uh, to be honest, if I posted that iPhone picture and said that it was a 1DX Mark II picture, I think most people wouldn't argue with that at all. They'd be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, that looks high quality. That looks like a 1DX. Which is scary. It's scary how close they are. And uh, to give the 1DX even more of a leg up, those photos were in RAW and the iPhone, those were just JPEGs through software now even with a tiny little sensor like the one inside of an iPhone 11 Pro, you can compete with something like a 1DX2 that has a massive sensor like this sensor, hold on guys. This sensor in here, it's it's huge, it's way bigger. It's like, it's bigger than this whole, whole three camera plate right here. It's bigger than that. So all three of the iPhone's uh, sensors for the cameras fit inside one 1DX sensor. That's how big of a difference there is between the sensors, which is, it's crazy. Now with that software, we can get similar looking depth of field or even more. We can get dynamic range even more than on the 1DX2 and the overall colors and image is starting to look really, really high quality for a smartphone. Even in low light at ISO 1250 for the 1DX, the iPhone was keeping up just fine. It doesn't look quite as good in my opinion, but again, there's more dynamic range and I don't even think that the HDR was kicking in fully here. So yeah, even in low light, the smartphones are getting a lot better again because of computational photography. I will say that the iPhone pictures definitely took a little bit more tweaking to kind of get them to the same level as the 1DX2 when I was editing them. And I think the 1DX2 has a, a nicer quality tone to the details. It just has this like smoother vibe to it, but still the detail is there. Whereas the iPhone is kind of over sharpening things at times. But honestly, I'm 
blown away that the results are this close. When I when I thought of this idea, I didn't think that they would be this close. I knew that the cameras are, are pretty good in the iPhone, but not that good. And yes, the software is still limited. It doesn't always work perfectly. You kind of have to be at, at a perfect distance from your subject. You can't be too far away. And sometimes it just screws up the depth mapping. For example, in these photos of Matt, uh, the glasses, they had a really hard time. And a lot of times it would blur the side of the glasses instead of keeping those sharp like they should be. But even that can be fixed in post. And you can also make your photos even better with something like an app called Focus. Because the iPhone saves all the metadata inside of that photo, you can actually use an app like Focus and you can refocus your image. You can change the focus to the background or the foreground if you made a mistake. You can refocus it literally anywhere you want. You can change the look of the bokeh. So if you want it to be more like an anamorphic oval look or if you want to add a shape to the bokeh, you can do whatever you want. You can even change the, the look of the lens so you can emulate different types of lenses using this app, which is just crazy. And more importantly, you can fix those little errors in the depth mapping, like for example, Matt's glasses, and you can choose what parts should be in focus and what shouldn't be. Are you freaking out yet? Cause this is, this is like mind blowing stuff. The fact that we can do so much with a $2,000, yes, that's still expensive, but a $2,000 smartphone that does so much more than just take photos and videos, but it also takes really nice photos and really nice video. I'm, I'm speechless. What the heck? How is that even possible? I feel like there's like these magician engineers that are just like working in the background, just creating this magic and, and just like not even making a big fuss about it. But then of course, for things like the super wide angle on the iPhone, we can't use portrait mode. So we're, we can't get that sh nice shallow depth of field and all of those extra things. So this is where I think something like a 1DX really starts to shine. You get that nice depth. Uh, but again, you get a little bit more dynamic range on the iPhone. So it's like, it's, <laughs> It's getting pretty wild. I don't think we're quite at the point where uh, a pro should get rid of their DSLRs or mirrorless cameras and just shoot on an iPhone. But I do think for a lot of kind of hobbyists or amateurs, the iPhone is way more than you'll ever need in your lifetime right now. And it's just getting better with every software update, with, with every new iPhone, every new smartphone. It's just getting better and better and better. DSLRs and mirrorless cameras, they're big, they're heavy, they're expensive. This lens alone is $2,000. This camera body is $5,500. It's really, really expensive. It only takes photos and videos. It doesn't do social media or anything like that and it's hard to use. An iPhone is so much easier to get that shallow depth of field, whereas with, an, with a real camera like this, you kind of have to know the settings and figure out how to get that nice shallow depth of field. It's not hard, but still take some figuring out and for just like a person using a, a camera for the first time, it might not be completely obvious. Whereas with the iPhone, you're like, oh, portrait mode, boom. Oh yeah, got it. But of course, DSLRs, mirrorless cameras also have really big benefits. For example, being able to change the lens, that's probably the biggest thing or one of the biggest things. You have way more control over the settings. You're not gonna have any, any hiccups with the shallow depth of field or anything. It always works. You're not gonna have any errors with the software. And of course, that bigger sensor size really does give more pleasing details and just highlight roll-offs. And it just looks a little bit more natural and organic in my opinion. So there are big advantages to having something like a DSLR or a mirrorless camera still. But for something like posting on social media, using all of those computational photography techniques, software that's that's happening in an iPhone, I really do think you can get away with just posting an iPhone photo nowadays in portrait mode and nobody will bat an eye at it. Nobody will be like, oh, that's just iPhone. That doesn't look as good. You could literally go back to being iPhone only on Instagram right now, and I don't think anybody would really notice. Anyways, I just wanted to make this video, A, to show how crazy it is that we have this 
super powerful photography and videography machine camera in our pockets right now. And B, you really have no excuses. There are no excuses nowadays because even your iPhone takes incredible pictures, incredible photos, incredible video. All it takes for you is to get out there, use your camera, use your phone, figure out the techniques, figure out lighting, composition, all of those things and work hard at it. Anybody right now could become a photographer or videographer, which is amazing, but it also means for people like you maybe, or people like me who do this as a profession, it means we can't get complacent because there's a lot of up and coming people because everybody has one of these. There's a lot of people getting into videography and photography and you gotta kind of raise the bar. You gotta raise your level of skill and just keep learning. You cannot get complacent right now. And I'm also really, really curious to see when is computational photography really gonna start coming into these mirrorless and DSLR cameras because I think they have to start using it in order to step up their cameras because Apple, Samsung, all of these companies are putting so much effort into researching better ways to make their cameras better. And I think uh, the Canons, the Nikons, the Panasonic, Sony's, they're all just mostly focusing on the hardware side of things and not as much on the software. So. I'm really curious to see when is computational photography really gonna start kicking into DSLRs and whether or not we're gonna have smart mirrorless cameras soon. You'll take a photo and it'll just like redo your whole <laughs> image the way you want it. I'm pretty sure that's gonna happen in the future. Anyways, I hope you guys like this video. I would love to know your thoughts. So comment down below, give this video a like and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. I will see you guys later.